Jane Cleary. Um, just for clarification, I'm not based in Auckland. I'm based in Wellington. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but I do come up to Auckland when I can. What do I press? This, okay, cool. Awesome. All right, so it's a bit of a long talk, so please bear with me. Um, so what I did was um, prepare a um, companion web book that you can access at the URL up there, and there's a GitHub repo as well for some of the small amounts of code that you will see in this talk. So I made this talk largely for myself as at four years ago when I started working with geospatial data and I didn't really understand what was out there, um, especially when I wanted to understand cities, um, how they work, how they don't work, um, and also what are the tools and what are the possibilities that you have um, access to. Um, so we'll be going through some learnings that I've had over the years and uh, hopefully it's of value and interest to others. Um, we'll start off with, um, yeah, just a very basic introduction and hopefully can communicate the perspective that I have uh, to you. Um, a little bit different probably from others in this conference, so just pretty much all code rather than using tools like QGIS. Um, and then we'll go into learning more about cities from points of interest, transport networks, and then finally buildings. Um, yeah, so if you want, you can follow along on the web book or um, just look at the slides here. Um, cool. Uh, what I found, um, maybe wait for everybody to come in. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they must have finished quite late. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we're almost at the tail end. Cool. Um, yeah, so the perspective of this talk is to take people from being an urbanite, as it is somebody who just lives in a town or a city, uh, to being an urbanist. And um, I really like these um, quotes from Strong Towns that, you know, an urbanist is somebody, it's not really a formal title, which I used to think it was, just, you know, something that was... Um, applicable to architects or urban planners, but it's really anybody who's interested in looking deeper into how cities function. Um, and what's especially appealing to me is to do that through a myriad of uh, different perspectives. So if you come from uh, architecture or urban planning, that's great, you have that specific lens in understanding a city, but equally you could be a physicist like me, um, you know, and you could understand the city through that perspective um, and any others. Um, uh, so it's really quite a quite a nice way, I think it opens up the, the field to people coming to doing city analysis from a bunch of different perspectives and therefore mining a lot of insights and something that's quite relevant today given that you know we're increasingly urban around the world and that's really not going to stop. And it's definitely not going to stop anytime soon in some of the developing countries. The largest growing um, places are in Africa and in Asia. So what I would like to emphasize in this talk is, you know, when you start doing um, urban analysis, it's really producing visual output. So these are two examples that I will talk about. So the first one is just building collages of what our urban environments look like and um, doing that with a sort of geospatial data lens. And the second is a sort of classic bigger ground diagram um, where, you know, you're representing a city just using the built and the highlighting the built and the unbuilt the figure on the ground. Um, so I use um, Python or R, and one thing that I uh, find is it's hard to tell people which one to start with, so here's a very rough um, kind of rubric. So if you like a lot of um, statistical visualization and analysis, R is maybe more suited to you, um, or if you want to sort of um, stretch the limits of machine learning and do all kinds of cool stuff in the cloud, then maybe you can start with Python. But to be brutally honest, you could start with the other language and you could still do um, uh, machine learning in R, you can still do really nice visualizations and statistical modeling in Python. A lot of the code examples that you'll see are in R, um, but some of the stuff is, is in Python. So if you go to the GitHub repo, you'll be able to find links to where those um, codes uh, sit. Cool, so we'll start off with urban views. Um, if you are just a, a beginning urbanist, um, you're just interested in the cities that you live in or the ones that you visited, 
um, one of the first nicest things is you know, take photos, right, and put together a collage. What are the similarities in some of the features that you really like, be it architectural features, um, like in this case you're seeing the similarities in Victorian architecture around London, um, or if you're interested in landscapes or green spaces. Uh, so you can just put this collage to really con construct a really nice narrative about you know, what you see, what you potentially don't see. Um, and what's really cool is that even if you're not in the city that you want to study, you can still access um, photographs of that city and build your own collage, which is this example here. Um, so you can just be an armchair flaneur or a flaneuse, if I'm pronouncing that correctly for the French people in the audience. Um, so yeah, so the way to pronounce this, uh, what am I saying? The way to build this is very, very simple. It's just a single function to Google Street View. That is not open data, but it is um, very generous in the way that you can access um, uh, the data from Google Street View. So it's just one function where you state the coordinate that you want to take a photo from and the direction that you want the photo off, and that's the heading. And with that, you can build your own little collage of cities that you're interested in or particular views of cities that you're interested in. Cool, so you've gone from just somebody who's starting your journey in urban analysis, got some pictures, and what do you do next, right? This is the sort of typical geospatial um, analysis that people get into. You start with point data um, before you go to the more sophisticated representations of space. And it comes out terribly here, um, so sorry about that. So maybe you can look at the screen, but that's Wellington, and the dots are um, cafes that are around Wellington. So people who are used to OpenStreetMap um, just to note that you know, if you wanted to access that data with R or Python, it's really easy. This is like 20 lines of code, um, and you get an interactive map at the end of it. Um, I've taken a screenshot here, but you'll be able to see the interactive map online. Um, so all you have to do is you um, write a query for the bounding box, and um, then you just use a really lovely plotting library called Tmap, and you set it to an interactive mode, and you can plot all of the cafes. And if you're in the interactive view, you can sort of hover over the points and you can get additional information, you know, what's the name of the cafe, what are some of the other attributes of it. And you can do similar in Python as well with um, Folium and other tools that are available there. Um, but that's, you know, getting data is only the first step of any kind of analysis. Um, there's some really nice examples um, of geospatial analysis across blogs as well as papers. Um, this was really interesting. It sort of looks at um, coffee shop density or cafe density with house prices. And what's fascinating here is that, you know, there's a lot of underlying urban processes that result in these two very different phenomena. So where people want to live and where they also want to have uh, a lot of coffee. And so this is what you can start to tease out as you get interested just in the world around you. Are there associations between some of the quirky things that you see or are they just totally disconnected? Cool, and this is um, probably the bit that I spend the most amount of time on, um, not just because I work at the Ministry of Transport, but it's something that I'm really interested in um, because I walk a lot and I really enjoy cycling. So we spend a little bit of time here. Um, once again, like with cafes, you know, it's really easy to get data of um, transport networks from OpenStreetMap, whether you're interested in cycleways or just the road network um, or PT. Um, so this is an example centered in Auckland, um, and you've take, I've taken a sort of a one kilometer radius around and just gotten the street network, which is tagged with the highway tag in OpenStreetMap. And like you can see, so I'm kind of showing you these code snippets just for anybody who's not experienced, by the way, in coding, just how easy it is to build and get data um, from OpenStreetMap if you're not used to it. Um, and that just sets you up for doing anything uh, further because this is often the possibly the hardest step, or might be perceived to be the hardest step. Um, and once again, the same tools, you use Tmap, but this time you're looking at a static view rather than an interactive one to plot uh, the lines here. So what's really powerful about transport networks and using code in particular is that you, know, you can traverse them in the digital world as you would in the real world. So um, you, know, you can basically plan a route um, and this is stuff that we're used to all the time if we use tools like Google Street, Google Maps. Um, you know, you can start your, you can state your starting point and where you want to get to, and it will plot you the, the shortest distance route, or sometimes maybe the more convenient route. Um, and so you can do exactly that um, in 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 Python in this case. Um, you can then easily extend it to within like microseconds compute multiple routes to the same destination. 
And what you can do instead is, you know, the starting points are basically summarized um, by the distance to the blue point there, which is actually a playground. Um, you can then connect up all the points that are kind of similarly located from uh, the central location, and you can create catchment areas. And for those who are more familiar with isochrones, it's pretty simple once you have a catchment to then convert it to um, uh, like polygons that are at the same time uh, in terms of travel time. So this is pretty powerful and it really doesn't take a lot of time to go um, from getting street network data to actually building your own catchments. And once again, you'll be able to find some code um, and also packages that really make this super easy uh, to do. Um, you can then extend that even further um, to build this very, very messy map on the left where you've you know, started off with every single intersection in Wellington and you've looked at the shortest path to um, the Wellington railway station, which is hiding um, in the red, big red circle. Um, and then what you do is you sort of sum up on every link the number of routes that pass through it. So you kind of have a, a heat map um, you know, going from sort of zero to about 4,000, 5,000 routes. Um, it doesn't look very exciting, but you can actually filter it. You get the top 5% of links um, that have you know, the, num the most number of um, routes going through them. And what you start to see coming out is actually the hierarchy of the street network. And in this case, because you're going to the center of the city, you're actually seeing what you know, even a transport planner would say, yup, these are the kind of core um, arterial roads that take you there. Um, but what's really interesting is you don't just see the motorways that are colored in yellow, but you're also seeing all of the key um, channeling roads that bring in traffic from where people live in the suburbs. Um, and the really powerful thing about this approach is that I've now routed it to the center of the city, but you could move that point, say, to the hospital, or you could move it to another location. You can actually start to see what are the key um, roads that bring people to this um, area of interest. So it's one way of kind of figuring out where your potential transport bottlenecks are, and then seeing, okay, well, what are they alternative routes and how bad are they really? Because um, sometimes the alternatives are terrible. Um, and this is the, the thing that's particularly close to my heart is actually example of walking. Um, I walk a lot, but not a lot of people walk. And um, as you sort of wander around, you realize, okay, why are there not that many people just sort of um, walking around enjoying this beautiful city? And you realize, oh, it's really, really hilly. Um, I wonder if that's the problem. Um, so this is really what prompted me to kind of get into geospatial analysis was sort of virtually look at how problematic the hilly topography of Wellington really is uh, for walking. Um, so just like with the routing case, it's basically an extension of it. You, you know, start these sort of virtual walkers all over the city, and as they walk to their closest playground, which is, you know, a kind of a local amenity that you don't necessarily want to go to, but it sort of represents um, something that you could go to if you wanted to just walk in your neighborhood how long it takes people to walk there, um, accounting for the hills. So this is quite simple. The higher the incline, the, the, the lower, the, uh, the higher the travel time um, you have. And um, what's really interesting is, you know, there's, you can then build a map of how walkable the entire city is in terms of suburbs. Some of the suburbs are terrible. It takes you like 30 minutes to walk to your closest playground. Um, and you can start to pursue all sorts of interesting questions from there, um, which, Hopefully the councils look at, but I suspect they don't. Um, and I think that's potentially why you know we don't actually have a lot of people walking to to nearby amenities. Um, and so these are all kind of you know anal analyses that we can do as urbanists just to bring a little bit more insight into what it really feels like to live in a city and what it um, what are the barriers and the challenges to some of the changes that we want to see in the future. Um, and finally, you know, the same routing analyses um, for, this is probably more um, familiar to many of you, looking at accessibility, but from a, from a traveling perspective rather than from accessibility for all, including, you know, people of different abilities. Um, and some of these visualizations really highlight just how different mode access is. So if you want to get to, in this case, a tertiary hospital in Sao Paulo, um, it's very, very patchy to get there by bus. Again, you can't see it quite so clearly on the screen, but if you look at the, the ones on the side, you can see the getting to a hospital by car is just much, much faster. Um, and it's fairly homogeneous, so there aren't areas of considerable poor access, at least in the majority of the city. 
whilst if you're trying to get to the hospital by public transport, then it's really patchy and you can really only get good access if you are around the major routes or the major hubs of PT. Cool, so we'll get to the last set of um, analyses and that's around buildings. This is something that I'm getting more interested in, um, in, in the recent few months. Um, so there's not a lot here. Cool, and once again, following the same pattern, it's pretty easy to get data from OpenStreetMap for buildings. Um, instead of getting lines, you're now getting polygons, um, and the query is quite simple. You just add um, you know, the building tag to, to your data query. And again, this one is getting buildings around the center of Auckland. Um, these, I don't know of how many people are familiar with figure ground diagrams, but they're quite pervasive in, uh, in architecture and sort of urban design. They give you a good sense of what is the urban structure in terms of how big the building footprints are, how are the street networks um, oriented around the plots. Um, so what you see here, the buildings are filled in in black and the streets are colored or they're filled in in terms of their relative um, importance in the street hierarchy and OSM. So the wider they are, the, the, more, um, the larger the road is or the more traffic you can expect on it. Um, and you can really see the, the difference in terms of urban design that comes out of these 500 meter neighborhoods in um, two different, three different cities here. The first two are neighborhoods in Mumbai, which are sort of beautifully planned. They're very different to the rest of the city. They're sort of this colonial era, slightly post-colonial era um, architecture. So they're sort of lovely leafy neighborhoods with um, buildings and just mostly surrounded by very low traffic roads. Um, and you compare that with New York City that you know, probably many of you are familiar with. It's this grid structure, but what's really interesting is that you know, there's a lot of high traffic roads just around the major blocks. So you, know, you probably have a lot of local walkability, but you know, you're surrounded by cars constantly. Whilst if you're in Islington in London, this really nice, pretty neighborhood, you're sort of you know, similar to what you are in Bombay. Um, you know, you're mostly walking around local roads and they're just um, probably quite pleasant and very comfortable to walk around. Um, so these are the you know, very simple insights that you can pull out. There's a lot more that you can do once you've created just this data set of streets and buildings. Um, you can start to um, classify the, the city in terms of um, what uh, its sort of structure is, if you will, and you can sort of find different um, classes of urban design. And there's a lot of really interesting papers coming out uh, in the recent few months that look into that. But yeah, so that's it for the talk. Um, these are some resources and feel free to reach out to me. Um, yeah, if you've got any questions or wanna chat, thank you. So as a non-GIS expert and a frequent user of Google Maps uh, and OSM, uh, is there anything in between what you're doing here and OSM that is where you can do, for example, a query for cafes or uh, get various different views of a city uh, without doing the programming part of it? Ab absolutely love the IPython notebooks, by the way, that you'd love the, that you linked to here. Oh, cool, yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I don't use QGIS, so everything I do just starts with codes. Um, yeah, I don't know if there is a non-code way other than just going to Google Street Maps and taking a uh, Google Street View and taking a screenshot um, of what you want, which is totally possible, because that's actually often how I figure out what pictures I want to then get and sort of save uh, onto my computer. Um, but yeah, in terms of an intermediate that doesn't need you to code, I think I'd yeah, probably open it to the floor. It's, um, yeah, I think I came just from code to code, so I came from data science to geospatial work, so I just continued coding. Um, but I also found it quite powerful because it's, um, you know, once you've written a piece of code, you can just reuse it whenever you want or extend its use um, rather than having to start another project and copy over all of your resources and assets. It's a bit, bit tedious. Uh, great presentation, really amazing for me. I don't use OpenStreetMap data all that much, and um, 
It's partly because I don't like the way the default base map looks probably, but uh, those figure ground diagrams have got me going, so I'm like, okay, that's aesthetic. But um, uh, planning is so intensely political, right? And it's very obvious, it's sort of hinting through in some of your slides and stuff. I was just wondering if there's any times where some of the insights you develop from doing this kind of work leave you feeling very shocked about how cities are organised and uh, and kind of uh, if you'd like to share anything with us or a particular, particularly notable shock or moment of head explosion when you realised how things were set up? Yeah, that's a really great question actually. Um, yeah, I, I'm still quite new at all of this, so I'm still very much huddling around my laptop and just doing these analyses and trying to understand more. Um, but I was really surprised that in a hilly city like Wellington, they don't necessarily account for topography in the GIS work that they do. Um, because yeah, when you look at the council um, reports and you know where how they place the different playgrounds with a 600 meter catchment, it's like, yeah, that's great. But the 600 meters in one suburb is very different to <laughs> quite another one. Um, so who do you really expect to get there? I mean, I guess they're expecting people to drive, but you know, those assumptions are really not valid anymore, right? Like we want more people to walk and we definitely want more people to walk to a neighborhood amenity. Um, that really surprised me and shocked me. And I, yeah, I'd be keen to hear in the chats afterwards how you can take some of this stuff and bring it in front of the, the, you know, the counselors or the technical people and say, please change this or at least change how you consider um, access in the city. Don't just assume people have to drive to get somewhere. Um, yeah. I think I'm out of time. <laughs>